Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire, a recent report by the Parliamentary Committee on Official Languages, chaired by the Home Minister Amit Shah, has made a series of sweeping recommendations to the President about the use of Hindi. It wants Hindi to be the compulsory language for the examination for recruitment to government services. It wants Hindi to be the medium of instruction in all centrally funded institutions of higher learning in Hindi-speaking states and it wants it to be constitutionally obligatory for state governments to propagate Hindi. And all of that raises one critical question. Will this be acceptable to South India, where Hindi is infrequently spoken, but is frequently not popular? Joining me to discuss this subject is the Finance Minister of Tamil Nadu, Palanivel Teagarajan. Mr. Teagarajan, the recent report of the Parliamentary Committee on Official Languages which has been now presented to the president, recommends that Hindi should replace English as the language of examinations for recruitment of the government. It should be the only medium of instruction in Kendra Vidyales, IITs, IIMs, and central universities in Hindi-speaking states. And it should be constitutionally binding on state governments to propagate Hindi. How do you respond to these recommendations? Well, I think uh, the answer really to your first question is that it should be comprehensively unacceptable to most non-Hindi states. And I don't have to say this theoretically because my chief minister brought a resolution in the assembly, Tamil Nadu assembly about 10 days ago. And that resolution was unanimously passed uh, with, with a condemnation against the kind of uh, activity that was, uh, I mean, the kind of actions that were um, recommended in this committee report. And so, you know, it's it's not a political statement. It is a unanimous resolution of the Tamil Nadu Assembly that such a report and its implications are unacceptable. Now, in fact, you referred to your chief minister, Mr. Stalin. First, he wrote a letter to the prime minister where he said, and I'm quoting from that letter, these recommendations are against the federal principles of our constitution and they will harm the multilingual fabric of our nation. Thereafter, as you said yourself, the Tamil Nadu Assembly passed a resolution urging the Modi government not to implement these recommendations. Have you had a response to either the letter or the resolution? Uh, not to my knowledge. I must say that I'm currently traveling overseas. And so it's possible that something has happened in the last two, three days that I'm unaware of. But to my knowledge, we have not had any formal response. Let me add for the sake of the audience that if there has been a response, it hasn't been made available to the media. And I would imagine that if there was a response, the media would have been told. And therefore, the fact that there's nothing in the media suggests there's no response to either the letter or the Tamil Nadu Assembly's resolution. Let me go one step further with you, Minister. The former Secretary General of the Lok Sabha, PDT Achari, writing in the Hindu, says that according to the Official Languages Act of 1963, under which this parliamentary committee was constituted, its remit is only to review the progress made 
in the use of Hindi for official purposes and to report specifically on that issue to the president. He says the committee is not mandated to recommend the medium of instruction in universities or professional institutions. In other words, by making these recommendations to the president, the committee has exceeded its remit. Do you agree with that? Uh, 100%. It has it far exceeded its constitutional uh, boundaries. It has recommended things that it was never in the realm of its uh, kind of purview. And I would almost see it as a statement of aggression against non-Hindi states and non-Hindi speaking people uh, in its kind of uh, draconian recommendations. And that's the right word, draconian recommendations which will profoundly transform society and make it significantly less equal and significantly more of a Hindi-centric uh, kind of ecosystem, particularly in government services, which will put everybody else at a huge disadvantage. I want to pick up on that phrase you use. You see these recommendations as a statement of aggression against non-Hindi speaking states. That's strong language, but that's what you see it as. Yeah, I don't see there's any other interpretation. If you start creating a special status for Hindi, often replacing English or eliminating English as an option, what is it other than a statement of aggression against states where Hindi is not the natural language, is not the, is not the mother tongue? Now, let's remember, I want to go, go back in history a bit and say that what is now what we consider the Hindi belt, which is the large eight or nine states under category A, as has been categorized in this report, were not carved out as one state at the beginning of independence, at the, the, at the inception. They were carved out as multiple states because they had multiple different languages. In fact, even this report acknowledges that there are something like 53 different regional languages in those A category states that are now clubbed together as kind of Hindi. So. There is a long history that when you impose Hindi as the de facto kind of way of getting your work done with the government or having the government function be accessible, it is a sure path to the uh, elimination, eradication or significant reduction of uh, existing regional languages and their ability to thrive and continue. And so, you know, especially in a place like Tamil Nadu, where our culture is thousands of years old, where every day we are discovering more and more artifacts uh, in the archaeological digs, suggesting that some version of Tamil script existed thousands of years ago, then surely we are not at all going to be acceptable or accepting of any efforts to kind of uh, suppress our language at the cost of promoting some other language. I hear what you're saying, that you will not accept any effort to suppress your language at the cost of another language. But there's a further problem for you. In that article by PDT Achari, he points out that these recommendations have a mandatory character. He says the government is required to act upon them. If his interpretation is correct and the government does act on these, what will your government do? Well, you know, I don't want to go into the realm of speculation, but I'll just say a couple of things philosophically. At least as far as this union government is concerned, no previous convention or norm or uh, what was considered, uh, you know, accepted uh, um, standard protocol has ever applied. You know, there have been uh, many actions this government has taken, which are not yet constitutionally validated and which are still pending adjudication by the Supreme Court, starting with something as, you know, uh, profound as demonetization. We have not even had, you know, real progress. Only recently hearings have started whether that was constitutional or not. So this government has a history of far exceeding what was the well accepted norms and boundaries of the Constitution or of committees and doing all manner of things. So they have their to their choice. They go either way. They go Things that are supposed to be done, they don't do. Things that should never be done, they do. And for whatever reason, the constitutional court doesn't seem to get involved at the right time. So the fact that it's mandatory is of the same cloth where this committee has far exceeded its remit. 
right? So, you know, at some level, it's hard for me to put these two in the same kind of balance, right? If, if already what the committee has recommended is beyond its constitutional remit profoundly, why should we now say that because it's mandatory, it should be applied mandatorily? Right? You break the constitution when it suits you, and then you enforce the constitution when it suits you. This is not an acceptable way of interpreting the constitution, in my opinion. I will only say philosophically, it's not a question of acceptance by one man or one government or one ministry. I've mentioned this before, I'll say it again. Whenever these kinds of, you know, dictatorial, authoritarian insertions of a particular way of uh, kind of functioning have been attempted in the past, particularly on the basis of language, they have led to very, very, very bad outcomes. This is not the first time, at least as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, we can remember the attempts to kind of thrust Hindi down our throats as a compulsory way of official and, and uh, learning and all that once in the 30s, once in the 60s. Both of them ended very, very badly. You're not talking about enforcing this on a village of like 100 people, right? It's a state, at least our state is almost 80 million people. There are many, many hundreds of millions of people in states where Hindi is not the national language. I don't see how this thing is going to be acceptable to any of them. You're saying in no uncertain terms, and I'm quoting you, that if these recommendations are implemented, there will be a very, very, very bad outcome in Tamil Nadu. In other words, this will not be acceptable to the people of the state, and there could be violence of the sort on language issues that we saw in the 60s. We could go back to that again. Yeah, I, I don't want to predict and I don't want to be a scaremonger. I'm just telling you that intelligent people learn from history. And we have to have some basis on which we form expectations and assess risk and assess outcomes. I'm saying when less than these attempts, when attempts that were less severe than these recommendations have been attempted to be implemented, they have led in the past to very, very bad, bad outcomes. I'm saying, you know, self immolations uh, martyrs, uh, firings, you know, all kinds of problems. I'm not predicting, I'm not scaremongering. I'm just saying that's what the true history is. That's undeniable, undebatable. What will happen this time? Who knows? Time will tell. Let me point out something else, which I think is very pertinent in this discussion about the Official Languages Act of 1963. That act legislated for English to continue indefinitely and I'm quoting as the official language along with Hindi for the official purposes of the union and also for transaction of business in parliament. Now, these recommendations, which are very sweeping, are actually contradictory to what parliament has legislated about English continuing. That is another level of contradiction alongside the one you mentioned earlier. No, I, I completely agree. I couldn't agree more. I'm saying not only is it beyond the remit of the committee to make such recommendations or, or, or I don't know, considerations for mandatory action, but such uh, recommendations also far uh, are in violation or in clear violation of many instances of constitutional precedent, either framed in the constitution itself or uh, clarified through acts and uh, amendments and legislations that have happened since independence, including the one you cite. So, you know, if you suddenly decide that you're going to implement, now, let, let me put it another way. Sometimes when I see such act, when I see such reports, and this committee incidentally was supposed to be a 30 member committee, as best I can tell, and it was already constituted as a 35 member committee instead of 30 as it was originally supposed to be, 20 Lok Sabha, 10 Rajya Sabha. Further, if you look at the composition of the committee, there were effectively about 21 of these 35 members were BJP and very, very few other states had any representation. Uh, Shiv Sena won in the subcommittee, BSP won, second subcommittee, AAP won, TDP won, INC won. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if you look at these subcommittee formations, literally like seven out of 10, seven out of 10, you know, four out of eight have been BJP members. So these committees themselves have, have not had uh, fair representation, in my opinion, and in terms of a ratio, you know, 21 out of 35 is, is a fairly high concentration in one political party, right? I've heard what you said very clearly, so that the audience can understand the basis on which 
you, your government, and the people of Tamil Nadu would be so strongly opposed to these recommendations. Let's try and analyze what these recommendations would actually mean. First of all, if it's compulsory for Kendra Vidyales, IITs, IIMs, and central universities in Hindi-speaking states to adopt Hindi as the compulsory medium of instruction, then students from South India, West Bengal, the Northeast, simply couldn't study there. Is that desirable for a country like India? Will it not also additionally diminish these institutions and in fact impoverish them of talent? And finally, won't that divide India? Yes, to all of the above. But I want to go one step further than that. Not only will it be detrimental to the non-Hindi speaking or non-native Hindi speakers who get admitted to, let's say, IITs in Kanpur or Delhi, it will actually be detrimental to the Hindi speakers who get admitted to these universities, right? It, Hindi is not the language of global technical research and uh, kind of analysis or, or propagation or innovation. English is, right? And there's so many studies to show that there's a, a strong correlation between increasing proficiency in, in English and human capital index. There's also a strong correlation to show that there's increasing correlation between proficiency in English and per capita productivity. Right? These, are, these are beyond doubt. Now let me go one step further. If you look at those countries where there's, you know, and there's all these analyses, I think by, uh, in this case, I'm trying to find the reference. Uh, it's the IMF, I think, or the World Bank, one of these. But they break down countries into very high proficiency, high proficiency, moderate proficiency. And then they break cities into the same category, very high proficiency, high proficiency, right? When you look at very high proficiency, here are the countries that, uh, that go first. Netherlands is not a native English-speaking country. It's a, it's a Dutch-speaking country. Austria, Denmark, Singapore, Norway, Belgium, Portugal, Sweden, Finland, Croatia. These are all companies, Germany countries that have their own language. They go out of their way to provide English proficiency to their students and their citizens as a way of being relevant and competing in a global economy. Why is it in the interest of UP students going to IIT Kanpur to not have that proficiency in technical education in English, but rather in Hindi, right? That's, that's one point. The second point I'm going to make is that whether you like it or not, you are now in a global economy, right? No matter how many trade barriers we try to put in all that, at the end, the government provides the export incentives, it signs free trade agreements, this is Union Government of India. So clearly, at some level, it is interested in participation in the global economy. If that is the case, how will it suit us to reduce English proficiency? I don't understand why this is beneficial for anybody. Can I make an additional point to the one you're making? We're very proud of the fact that we have a world-dominant IT industry. We're very proud of the fact that something like 17 or 18 top CEOs in the world of international finance and in the international corporate world are Indian. But if IITs, IIMs and central universities in Hindi speaking states now make Hindi compulsory and discard English or reduce the importance of English, our proficiency in IIT, our PIOs and their ability to run as CEOs, major financial institutions or major corporates will diminish and we will lose as a result, won't we? It will have an adverse impact on us. No, no, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's not keep this hypothetical. Let's take a very, very specific individual as an example. The CEO once of Google, now of the parent company Alphabet, is a gentleman called Sundar Pichai. He's a Tamilian from Madurai, I'm told, originally, right? He is a graduate of IIT Karakpur. He has made it to the top of arguably the largest and biggest revenue producing IT company or technology company in the world. He, by his self profession, he doesn't know how to speak Hindi. Right? That's what he's on record in a public uh, forum saying that he doesn't know how to speak Hindi. Let's imagine that he had been forced to do all of his schooling in Hindi. Would he have been capable of making it to the top, just as you said? So it's not a hypothetical discussion. There are actual examples. You take many of these CEOs of global companies. They are not proficient in Hindi. If you then switch them to be Hindi proficient and Hindi medium instruction as opposed to English, first of all, it's not clear that as much content is available in Hindi to bring them to the top of the 
knowledge curve. Second, whether they can then innovate from there and work in an economy that is largely driven on an English basis is also a question. Absolutely. Let's now come to a second implication of these recommendations. If Hindi replaces English as the language for examination for recruitment to government, then candidates from non-Hindi states will be placed at a considerable disadvantage. They simply won't know the language or they won't be as fluent in the language as candidates from Hindi speaking states. And that will mean that gradually or maybe pretty quickly, non-Hindi speaking candidates will get eliminated from all India services. And again, that has to be damaging for the fabric and unity of India. I, I don't know how I can uh, reinforce that point any further than by citing one statistic. Currently, many of the uh, UPSC and related union government examinations are offered either in English or in Hindi and much, much less so in regional languages. Already you can see that once these examinations started being offered in Hindi, there has been a much greater proportion of the total UPSC intake that comes from the Hindi speaking belt, right? Now, many of them may be not proficient in English and that may hurt their performance later because many of these people also go back to doing service in international postings, etc. But were you to make it now the only medium and reduce the options of other non-Hindi people, then you're going to end up with a monolithic workforce that only knows Hindi and finds it hard to function any other place in the world where there is not a universal basis for Hindi. That could be in the non-Hindi state, it could be on an international posting, it could be to the World Bank, it could be to the ED, uh, I mean, the, not the ED, the, the uh, World Bank, uh, you know, the, the IMF as the executive director, it could be to the ADB, it could be to the AIIB. So all these individuals, because I'm finance minister, I'm talking about the, the agencies I know, but it could be the UN, UN agencies, all these individuals will find themselves completely hamstrung. So I think... There is, you know, it, it's almost so profoundly wrong and so profoundly regressive and retarding that one wonders what was the motivation of creating such a report. I mean, at the core of it, that, that's, that's the, you know, the, 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 the heart of the issue. What was the intended upside of creating such a regressive, uh, backward looking, retrograde kind of report to the president? Do you want to guess at the question you asked? What do you believe was the motivation behind what you call a regressive retarding recommendation? Yeah, it's hard for me to put my, you know, myself in the heads of others with any degree of accuracy. But uh, one thing that worries me is that a union government that is failing to deliver in terms of real growth, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, kind of quality of life to people and a union government that has at best not suppressed the forces of bigotry and kind of uh, othering and unrest and at worst possibly encourage them then i wonder if this is more of the same and i'm just i'm just guessing here you know who am i to predict what the exact motivations were but if i was to say what i'm afraid of i'm afraid of that same logic that those who are not able to deliver in real outcomes are starting to look for other ways that they can provide a wedge and start creating a kind of, uh, you know, a separation and othering, uh, a fractioning, uh, a, a fracturing of society. In other words, the government is covering up for its failures in so many other respects by pushing these recommendations in the hope it will A, deflect attention, and B, it will create a fracturing that may work to the government's political benefit. In a nutshell, that's possible, what you... Possibly, 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 possibly. Let's come to a third implication of these recommendations. Now, these recommendations make it constitutionally binding on state governments to propagate Hindi. To take your government as an example, if these recommendations are implemented, the Tamil Nadu government in a state where Hindi is not spoken, in a state where Hindi is not even popular, will be now constitutionally bound to propagate Hindi. And secondly, if you don't do that, because it clearly goes against the wishes, feelings and culture of your people, then you are liable perhaps to be dismissed. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go into the realm of all those kinds of uh, uh, what I would consider both esoteric and extreme possibilities. Uh, but you know, there's there's uh, there's a problem of scale that people should not forget, right? Uh, if you are trying to do authoritarian things and thrusting things down the throats of people against their will, it's not. Uh, uh, feasible or realistic to do it to tens, let alone hundreds of millions of people. It's one thing if you're trying to suppress a country of two or three or five million people through authoritarian or dictatorial means. Maybe that's sustainable for some length of time. But a country of the vastness and plurality of India, uh, I don't think such moves are uh, in the realm of possibility in terms of success. They may yield all kinds of other outcomes. Uh, I don't want to speculate what those. Let me. Mean, but I'm not sure. This to you. in the realm of success. Yeah. Let me interrupt and put this to you. I accept that the possibility of your government being dismissed because of your opposition is esoteric and extreme, to use your language. But what is not esoteric and what is not extreme is the fact that if these recommendations are implemented, you will be constitutionally required to propagate Hindi. Are you prepared to do that? No, I, I don't think we'd ever be prepared to do that. But again, I'm not, you know, I'm one individual. I'm not even uh, the minister, particularly in terms of uh, in the portfolio of Tamil language and culture. Uh, I'm the finance minister. I have some views. Uh, they are, those are, of course, based on the public statements of my chief minister and the, you know, the uh, unanimous resolution passed in the assembly. Beyond that, uh, you know, all of us are just speculating and looking at hypothetical scenarios. I, I don't want to go into too, too far on that. Uh, Let that. me end by putting two quick questions to you and ask you for brief answers. Given the fairly strong nature of your opposition and your government's opposition and the Tamil Nadu Assembly's resolution to these recommendations, would you be prepared to go to the Supreme Court? to challenge them there and declare them as unconstitutional and dangerous to the fabric and unity of the country? Yeah, I would presume so. Again, I'm not the law minister, but I would presume so that were such things to be actually uh, kind of enter the realm of execution, I would presume that that would be an almost automatic outcome. But I can't speak for the government. I, I just uh, do a calculation and assessment as an individual. But as you said, you presume that this would be an almost natural outcome for the government of Tamil Nadu to do. Yeah, uh, and many others, I presume. Not just Tamil Nadu. Why only Tamil Nadu? Why shouldn't the government of Karnataka do it? Won't they be worried about Canada being affected? I mean, just because the BJP state doesn't mean that they're going to give up their language, right? BJP, I mean, governed state at this point. So in a nutshell, and this is my last question, these recommendations not only have the potential, but they actually have the capacity, if they're implemented, to divide India, divide it between North and South. And that is not something anyone would want, and yet that is inherent in these recommendations and their implications. Yeah, maybe I'll answer that slightly in a different way. In my understanding of the world, of our country, of the Tamil people, of the mindset, I don't see any way that such recommendations get successfully implemented, at least in the world as we know it today. And there may be many different outcomes, but I don't see any path from where we are today to a successful implementation of such recommendations were that to be attempted. Let me just leave it at that. Mr. Tiagrajan, I thank you for this interview. I'll simply repeat for the audience two things that you said, because I think they sum up what you believe is your government's position and what you believe could be the outcome if these recommendations are implemented. You believe that these recommendations are comprehensively unacceptable. That was virtually the first thing you said. And you also believe that if these recommendations are implemented, it would have very, very, very bad outcomes. I thank you for your clarity. I thank you for speaking out so forcefully. Take care. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. 
During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.